Take your Bible this morning. We're going to go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. My wife just pointed out in the bulletin, uh, today is not December the 14th, okay? Uh, that should be January, so in case you think you're trapped in some time loop somewhere, you're not, all right? How to make sure you frustrate Jesus. We're in the gospel according to Luke. We're going through all the book of Luke and uh, been taking our time and uh, been, went away for Christmas. We came back a couple weeks ago. So uh, today we're going to talk about how to make sure that you frustrate Jesus. Um, I've got quite a bit of text, so I'm going to read it as we get there. That's kind of the way I'm going to handle it this morning. But I want to begin with an explanation about this sermon title, Okay. The Bible makes it very, very clear that the acts and thoughts of mankind cannot frustrate the plans of God, okay? You and I cannot change the destiny. We are are not in control like God is in control, and uh, there's never a, 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 you know, God's not wringing his hands in heaven when there's a court ruling that goes awry or anything like that. We cannot frustrate or change the plans of God However, it becomes pretty obvious that we can frustrate him, and that term is the one that I would use for the feelings that we have, not necessarily that God has. There is a reoccurring theme that even has come into us into Luke as Jesus travels with these disciples, and that is that they are frustrating the fire out of him. That's just the way we would say it in the South, okay? Um, Just five verses above where we are this morning, Jesus says in verse 41, O unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? That sounds pretty frustrated to me, okay? Um, There's other occasions when they were caught in the storm and Jesus had to be woken up and he didn't understand those types. He said, why are you timid, you men of little faith? The translation is, you bunch of chickens. You know, trust me, I'm with you, I'm always. Later in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus will look at his disciples who were asleep and say, so you could not keep watch from with me for even an hour, for one hour. And then we all know at the end of the story when Jesus goes into the temple and there are the merchants in there taking advantage of what is happening there. And uh, he, he, you know, in the south, we'd say he throws a hissy fit. He said, Jesus entered the temple, cast out all those who were buying and selling in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. In the South, we'd say, he's ticked off, okay? He's ticked off. Now, do you understand then where I'm going with this sermon title? Jesus and the plans of God are not frustrated, but we do things that get in the way. So that's the way we're going to break this text down today. I'm going to talk to you about four ways that you can be sure that you can frustrate Jesus, okay? Number one, go ahead and put it and then we'll read, okay? Make a case for how wonderful you are. Make a case for how wonderful you are and you'll be sure to frustrate the Lord. Verse 46, same verses we read last week, but I'm not gonna preach it in the same way. And an argument arose among them as to which of them might be greatest. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you, this is the one who is great. We spent a whole sermon last week talking about only children go to heaven. Only children go to heaven. In other words, if you do not have a childlike attitude, one of faith and trust and complete dependence, then you don't go to heaven. Jesus is talking about this attitude, and he, the point is that I'm making is this attitude behind this argument. These guys are thinking too much of their selves. That's exactly what is wrong. We live in a generation, and we are all caught up in it, that are so focused and spend so much energy on what other folks think about them. It amazes me the things that people will put on social media to try to prop themselves up. I came across something, and it is so true because I'm of a certain age now. We'll just say it like that. In our 20s, we worry about what others think of us. In our 40s, we say we don't care what they think about us. And in our 60s, we realize they weren't thinking about us all along, right? Because everybody has their own life to live. And listen to me. C.S. Lewis said this. The essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity. Anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads us to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. 
Let that sink in. Pride is the complete anti-God state of mind. Satan's chief sin is pride. It filled his heart. It consumed him. He thought about God and he could not imagine being less powerful or less important or less appreciated than God was. So he says, I will raise myself up. I will become like the Most High. And that attitude, that pride positioned him in eternal animosity against God. And it will do the same thing to you. It is the root of all sins. Jesus told that parable or that story about the the Pharisee and the tax collector coming in to give their money. You remember that story where the the, the Pharisee comes in and he says, I thank you that I'm like other men and I'm not like that guy. Points him out. But the tax gatherer beats his heart in humility and says, be merciful to me, a sinner. Verse 18.9 of Luke tells us exactly why Jesus told that story. Let me read that verse to you. He told this parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Pride cannot do anything but drive you away from God. It alienates us from God. It impedes our spiritual growth. It necessitates that we be our own God, that we think that God must be happy. and best. He is so, so blessed because he has us on his team. Pride cuts us off from life because it cuts us off from the giver of life. It makes us judgmental and self-promoting. Self, everything about pride separates us from the spirit that God would want us to have. During the battle of the wilderness of the Civil War, there was a Union general named John Sedwig. And John Sedwig was checking the troops. They were set up behind a barricade. Across the way was the uh, Confederate soldiers, and he walked and checked on everybody. Well, there was a gap in the barricade, and he would walk through that thing, and his commanding officer said, look, General Sedwig, you need to be careful. You need to duck your head. And his famous words are, nonsense. They couldn't hit an elephant at that dis, And the bullet hit him. And he died on the spot right there. He did, got a fatal wound right there. Why? Because he was proud. He, he, we he become, we come, become so enamored with who we are and what we think and what we know to be true in our own heart that we can't imagine that we could be wrong. You want to frustrate Jesus? Act like a know-it-all. Treat people like they aren't important. You'll be sure to frustrate him. Let's move to our next part. Number two, think that you have a monopoly on God. Think that you have a monopoly on God. Verse 49, and John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out demons in your name, and we tried to hinder him because he does not follow along with us. But Jesus said to him, do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. After their petty agreement over greatness, it seems that John wants to move on, so he brings up a total new topic. He's just like trying to distract from what the, the mistake that they'd already made dealing with that. And John complained that he came across some folks that were casting out demons in Jesus' name, okay? But he has a problem because they're not one of the chosen disciples. The NIV translates it very well, a way that we would understand. We told him to stop because he is not one of us. He's not one of us. (laughs) He probably expected Jesus to commend him, but Jesus rebukes him. He says, don't stop him because if he is not against us, then he is for us. Let me tell you this sin in our life, okay? When we begin to criticize and minimize other Christian groups because they are not us. I love being Southern Baptist. I do. But don't you ever put that banner up and think that it gives you some right to look down on other people, okay? We can become as guilty of spiritual bigotry as John was in this case. In your notes, put this. Labels don't mean a thing to God. Labels don't mean a thing to God. In Acts chapter 2, the church is beginning. It's beginning to spread. But there is no other name for the church other than the church. It was the church. And it was that way for over 300 years. Then finally, under Constantinople, the uh, Christianity began to take hold, and the Roman Empire embraced it. They embraced it. So they began to call it the universal church. Actually, the word is Catholic. Little c, okay? Little c. It is the universal church. So all of a sudden, we have our first adjective to describe the church. 
the universal church. Well, guess what happens? A few hundred years later, the Greeks break away from this, and they develop what is the Orthodox church, the Orthodox church. And they had problems with the Roman, with the church, and the universal church, the Catholic church. Well, when the Greeks break away, then the Romans say, well, we're going to put our name on the front of this one. So it became the Roman Catholic church. Now, now you have the Roman Catholic church and the Greek church and It's no longer just called the church, and those two were competitors, and they called each other out as wrong. They wouldn't have anything to do with one another, so they built a wall to keep each other away. Lo and behold, before long, in the Orthodox Church, another group breaks off, the Russian Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church. A few hundred years later, some Christian Protestants rebel against the teaching of the Romans, so now we have the Protestant Reformation, and out of the Protestant Reformation becomes the Lutheran Church, and the Anglican Church, and the Presbyterian Church, and the Episcopal Church, and the Baptist Church. Starting to see a pattern here? Adjectives everywhere. Adjectives everywhere. And each of those groups began to bicker with one another. As a matter of fact, wars were fought over these adjectives. During the Spanish Inquisition, there were thousands of Protestants killed by the Catholics, but don't think that the Protestants didn't kill Catholics, because they did. And today, there are literally thousands of Christian groups, all in their own set of adjectives. Have you noticed this? (laughs) Drive around sometimes, pay attention. In Dade City, Florida, there's a church called, you ready for this? The First Church of the Last Chance World on Fire Revival and Military Academy. All right? In rural South Carolina, there is the Rapture Ready Weeping Mary Baptist Church. How about an international one? The the First Nigerian Church of the Crazy Mother. Okay? Shh, shh, don't say anything. In Alabama, there are a couple in the Tuscaloosa area. New Greater Hope Full Gospel Methodist Episcopal Church. Another one. Church of Movement Toward Freedom Outreach Ministries. And in South Alabama, there's one, the Fire Baptized Holiness Church of Christ of the Millennial Saints Incorporated. Do you know that the body of Christ has become more and more and more divided? Every time we have a disagreement and we build a wall and we put up this, 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 maybe not physical, but this barrier between us and them because they are not like us. And we have gotten further and further away from the beautiful word church. Church. The one that God intended us to be. And we tend to resent and reject all those who are not of us, who are not like us. And as a matter of fact, I know people, I know this because I see them and hear them that they think that when they put others down, they are doing God's work. Those are the same type people that killed during the Inquisitions. And we get, we get other people who use Jesus' name, and we say, stop what you're doing. Don't do that. Why? Let me put this, the B one in your notes. Anyone who honors the name of Jesus is my friend. The key to this lesson is that they were casting out demons in Jesus' name, okay? They were doing something good. Now, you know you know me. I'm not advocating for universalism. I am not one who says that there are many ways to heaven. Listen to me. There is only one way to God, and that is through Jesus, okay? Jesus is not just one of the ways. Jesus is not one of many ways. As a matter of fact, Jesus is not the best way to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. Okay? He is not the best one to pick out of a group. He is the only way to heaven. And I recognize that, but at the same time, I know that many groups, you know, are not legitimate, and they do terrible things in the name of God. I'm, you know, you get me. I'm not doing that. I'm not worried about that. But what I want you to see is the defining characteristic is about the deity of Jesus Christ. They believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came to save the souls of men, and by faith and faith alone in him, you can be saved. I can worship with that brother. Amen? Huh. But we do it, don't we? We label people. Oh, she's a charismatic Christian. Oh, he's a Calvinist Christian. He's a moderate. He's a liberal. He's a fundamentalist. Forget the labels, guys. Listen to me. Do you not realize 
that those people are our friends, even more than that. If they honor the name of Jesus Christ, they are your brothers and sisters. Your brothers and sisters. John Wesley was a founder of the Methodist Church in a revolution, okay? He was an Anglican preacher. And he began to do things that they didn't agree with. You know what he was doing? He began to preach in the fields, outside of factories, and in the streets. And he began to sing this terrible music. It was so, so worldly. There were a bunch of songs that his brother had written. And they took most, a lot of the tunes from the drinking songs that they were doing. You know, the, here, here's how bad it was. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, the, the horror, right? We sing those and we embrace those. As a matter of fact, in our new movement in Christianity today, we're thinking those are too old. We don't need to sing those anymore. But in that day, it was so radical. And he was criticized and ostracized. That's what we do. John Wesley said, I have no more right to object to a man for holding a different opinion of mine than I have to differ with a man because he wears a wig and I wear my own hair. But if he takes his wig off and shakes the powder in my face, I shall make it my duty to leave him as soon as possible. He said, I resolved to avoid that narrowness of spirit, a party zeal. Sometimes we have a party zeal, don't we? That miserable bigotry which makes so many unready to believe that there is any work of God but among themselves. Do you ever feel like that? Then you are wrong, okay? You are wrong. Do you know that when we get to heaven, we're not going to be divided. God's not going to corral us into different areas. St. Peter's not going to get a loudspeaker out and says, okay, all of you Baptists, go over there. Whoa, 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 I should be clear. The Southern Baptists over here, the Baptists over there, the Methodist, that's not going to happen. So let's start loving and praying for and encouraging those who are not just like us. Amen? All right. Number three, you want to frustrate Jesus? Be insensitive and mean-spirited. The insensitive is, and we talked about this some, they just don't get Jesus' plan, okay? They don't get his goal. And it came about, verse 51, and it came about when the days were approaching for his ascension that he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. He set his face toward Jerusalem it, and I truly believe that that is there because of all the things that just come before. There is so much noise around Jesus. Fighting for greatness. Let's get rid of the children. Let's, you know, kick these folks out. All this noise happening around him. And Jesus focuses on what he is there for. Put in your A here. The disciples were insensitive to Jesus' goal. They were insensitive to Jesus' goal. That word where it says he resolutely set out, he steadfastly set his face. It, it is a word picture, if you will, of a man leaning into a storm trying to walk. That is the idea. Do you understand? You got to keep your nose up. You got to lean into it to walk. A hurricane. Jesus is headed toward Jerusalem in a hurricane type environment. Everything that pressures of hell are pushing against him. Satan is using everything possible to distract him and to make sure nobody understands what's going on here. It is a hurricane of opposition, and he knows what awaits him in Jerusalem. But he sets his face. He knows that he will be betrayed by one disciple. He will be denied by another disciple, and he will be forsaken by all of them. But he set his face. He knows that he's going to be arrested and falsely accused, but he had his mind on his purpose. He knows that he's going to be beaten and bloodied, but he did not forget why he was going. He knew his flesh would be ripped from his back with that whip, but he did not turn around. He knew what awaited him with a heavy cross beam on his back as he walked to the hill to his death, but he took every step as he was told to do. He knew that shame and disgrace would come upon him. He knew that everybody was going to flee from him. And he knew on that cross that he would become sin. And when he became sin for all of mankind, that the Father would abandon him. He would forsaken him. But he kept going. But he also knew that three days later, 
He's going to bust out of that tomb, amen? And he knew that he would ascend to the Father and be back. That is why he kept on going. Hallelujah, amen? Jesus is a man on a mission, a person with a purpose, and he did not let anything get in the way of that. The disciples, however, harbored a nasty attitude. That's the next one, the B one. Let's pick it up, more noise. And he sent messengers on ahead of him. And they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. And they did not receive him because he was journeying with his face toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And he said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And they went on to another village. In your facts, do you see this? Face the fact. Some people will reject Jesus and his followers. They're going to. You know this. The Samaritans hated the Jews. The Jews hated the Samaritans. 2,000 years ago, in that region of the world, it is the same. This area of the world, as a matter of fact, that Jesus is journeying through, is what we call the West Bank today. A a Jew will, will... We'll be very careful to go there, and it has not changed. It was like that centuries ago with Jesus. As a matter of fact, the Jew traveling through that area would usually go down around the Jordan to avoid that area. They would follow the Jordan River up. But not Jesus. He planned to go right through Samaria. Why? Because he is offering them a chance. He is giving them an opportunity to receive him. He came for all men. And he comes for those people in the neighborhoods that you and I don't want to drive through. He walked through this place with a purpose. Of course, we see the village rejected him, and they rejected the messengers of Jesus. Today, we live in a generation much the same. They have heard about Jesus, but they are rejecting him. And he continues to give them another chance and another chance. So where do we fit in this story? Our job is to be like this advanced crew that Jesus sends out. We are to tell people about Jesus, to announce that Jesus is coming. You need to get ready for him. And oftentimes, we're going to get the same reaction that they got from the villagers. They're going to say, we don't want him here. I don't want him coming through my town. I certainly don't want him staying here. Here's what I want you to learn about this, okay? You're a Christian, say I am. It is not your job to make them receive him. It is your job to tell them that he's coming. That is it. It is your job to tell them that he's coming. We get caught up in the, 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 the rejection, and we, think it, we take it too personal. Jesus is the same as he was 2,000 years ago, because in this story, what does he do? He goes to another village. Did you see that? Jesus didn't get hung up on that. You had your chance. I give it to you. You get to choose. The same is true today. He will go to another village if you don't choose. And we should go to another village if they reject. And we've got to remember, they aren't really rejecting us. They're rejecting the one who sent us, okay? But there's a second lesson to learn here in your notes. We are not to judge and punish those who reject us. That's what we do, okay? Let's just get that out there. If they don't like us, we, we, we come back at them and we, we talk ugly about them. We put notes on Facebook about how spiritual we are and how spiritual they ain't, okay? We often forget these saints because the Catholic Church has given them that label, St. Saint, Saint James and St. John. They were normal people like us, and they had all kinds of issues, and um, it comes out right here. How dare those Samaritans reject us? Do they not know? Why, why aren't they showing us? What an insult. I'm going to call down fire from heaven and consume them. The only thing that keeps you from doing that is because you can't do it. There's some people you'd burn up today. Don't, don't, don't play games with me. You'd smoke them. And Jesus turns around and says, you don't get it. You know what is happening in them? Jesus rebukes them because they are, in their spirit, hateful and vengeful. And he informs them that is the wrong kind of spirit. That is not the work of the Holy Spirit. They were bitter and angry and hateful. Jesus says, I came to save people, not destroy them. If they reject me, that's on them, but I'm not going to wipe them off the earth because they rejected me. 
Let's, you getting this, folks? You getting this? Here were two of the disciples that had spent the last two years with Jesus. They've heard everything that he said, the teaching, the love that he's shown, all those things, and they're ready to destroy an entire village in the name of God. That is not ended. I fear there's a lot of damage done on the cause of Christ today because the same spirit in James and John, they were, they were called sons of thunder, and we know why now, okay? But that spirit lives on in the church, in Christians, who are wronged or hurt, and we feel that emotional storm blow, boiling up in them, right? You, you've seen them. And they, they, there's a flash of lightning and the anger rises up and there's that verbal rumble of thumb, thunder. They are the same thing. That terrible fire is bestowed on somebody else. You listen to me and you listen to me good. It is not our job to judge and punish those who don't follow along with us. Not our job. Even when we're insulted, even when God is insulted, Jesus is the one insulted here. Listen to me. God will take care of that, okay? God will take care of that. He will judge them perfectly. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We live in a generation that's just angry, okay? We have road rage and run people off the road. We have air rage where passengers are going off on, on stewarders and stewardesses. We have even fan rage where these parents are going out on the field with, with, and their children are out there and they're picking fights with a fit. What is going on? We're a generation of rageaholics. And the Bible warns about that because it calls it that you will develop a spirit of bitterness, that unresolved anger in you, and that root of bitterness. You become angry, you become bitter, till you want to hurt somebody. I bet most of you have heard this story, but I heard about a Sunday school teacher who was trying to get his point across to a Sunday school class, so he took a white poster board and he put it up in the classroom, big white poster board, put it up on the wall, and when the kids come in, what's up with that? He said, well, what we're going to do today, he says, um, we're going to draw a picture of whoever you don't like, and we're going to let you throw darts at it. So they did. <laughs> One girl had just broken up with a boyfriend, so she drew a picture of that woman who had stolen him. No one did of his little brother. No one did of some kid at school that he felt was doing it wrong. So they were throwing, they were having a time, man. It's the best class they ever had. Throwing those darts, throwing those darts. And it was about time to get through. They didn't want to quit. It was tearing it up. And the teacher finally said, We've got to stop. You know what happens, right? He takes the poster board down and turns it around. And on the back side is the image of Jesus. And it had an inscription across the bottom. And so much as you have done this to the least of my brothers and sisters, you've done it to me. We throw darts sometimes and we cause damage. And Jesus says, that's just like you're reacting to me. That's strong, isn't it? Hmm. Number four, you give excuses why you can't follow Jesus, okay? Give excuses. We're talking about why you frustrate Jesus. I've been thinking about having a no excuse Sunday. You read this? To make it possible for everyone to attend church next Sunday, we're going to have a special no excuse Sunday. Cots will be placed in the foyers who, they, who say, Sunday is my only day to sleep in. There will be a special section with lounge chairs for those who feel it, our pews are too hard. Eye drops will be available for those with tired eyes from watching TV late Saturday night. We will have steel helmets for those who say the roof will cave in if I ever come to church. Blankets will be for, furnished for those who think the church is too cold and fans for those who think the church is too hot. God, I live in that every week. Scorecards will be available for those who wish to list the hypocrites present. Relatives and friends will be in attendance for those who can't go to church and cook dinner too. We will distribute stamp out stewardship buttons for those who feel that the church is always asking for money. One section will be devoted to trees and grass for those who seek God in nature. Doctors and nurses will be in attendance for those who plan to be sick on Sunday. The sanctuary will be, sanctuary will be decorated with both Christmas poinsettias and Easter lilies 
for those who've never seen the church without them. And finally, we will provide hearing aids for those who can't hear the preacher and cotton for those who can hear the preacher. All right? We are full of excuses all the time. The theme of Luke chapter 9 is discipleship. If you go back and look at verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. This text ends with three potential disciples. People who come before him and say they're going to follow him. So let's look at these three and see how they deal with this. The first one is, following Jesus must have priority over your possessions. Following Jesus must have priority over your possessions. Verse 57, and as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Everywhere Jesus went, he told people to follow him. Follow me, follow me. This potential, first potential, he sounded pretty excited, right? I will follow you anywhere. But Jesus has an ability to see beyond words and to see your heart. I remind you of that all the time. And he knew this man had not considered the cost of discipleship. He said, you say you want to follow me, but in today's terms, he describes that he's pretty much a homeless man. He has nowhere to lay his head. He doesn't check into inns. And here is a man obviously attached to those things, or Jesus wouldn't have went there with him. Here's the thing he wants to, he wants him to leave his comfort zone. And he knows this man is not willing to do that. There's a danger in this, in this message from Jesus, that we get too attached to our stuff. <laughs> if you are a true follower, you put more value in your heavenly home than your earthly stuff, okay? Than where you hang your hat. We hold on to our possessions too tightly. God is preaching to me right this. I got stuff that I'm holding on to. because you know, Have you seen those, those commercials? Are they, what are the commercials where you're getting, uh, becoming your parents, right? Right? Where the one walks up there and he's got the molding. He says, I'm saving this molding. That's me, okay? I got some wood out there I'm saving for, you know, I feed termites is what I'm doing. I, you know, well, we do that. That's what Jesus says. He says, you need to measure this call. You need to play, make sure that the kingdom of God is above your possessions. Doesn't stop there. Number two, following Jesus must have priority over your plans. Over your plans. The second disciple seems to have a legitimate excuse. He wants to be excused to bury his father. Verse 59. And another said to him, and he said to another, follow me. But he said, Permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. On the surface, this sounds, sounds kind of harsh and uncaring, doesn't it, by Jesus. This guy says, Let me go bury my dad. He says, You don't need to bury your dad. There's something you don't understand here. First of all, Jesus is not implying that we shouldn't take care of our family. This guy would not have been here in this setting had his father died. The Jewish law said you need to get him buried within 24 hours. They didn't embalm like the Egyptians or any other people. You had to get him buried. So if his father was indeed dead, he wouldn't have been here. He would be about the business because the Jewish burial customs said 24 hours. So this guy's dad is not dead. You say, well, what's going on here? Bible scholars totally agree on this. When he says, first I must bury my father, he is speaking to the, to the responsibility, the duty of the firstborn son. It is the firstborn's responsibility to take care of that and to stay at home until his dad died. That's what Jesus is saying. This guy, it is without, it was with certainty, this guy's dad is alive. You know what he's telling Jesus? I'll follow you one day. One day. See, I got these plans in order, and I'm not willing to deviate from my plans. 
I'm not willing to allow anything to get in the way. And Jesus says to him, let the dead bury the dead. What he says, let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. He says, you are letting your plans get in the way of this. He's the first spiritual procrastinator in the Bible, okay? Are you a spiritual procrastinator? Maybe you just hadn't got around to it, but here it is. You really intend to follow Jesus, just not quite there. But there's some other things you got to get done or get handled or get taken care of before you do that. Oh, you want to just stop showing up and being a tender. You want to get involved in Sunday school and get deeper involved, but I got some other things I got to do first. Oh, you intend to follow Christ in baptism. But I need to explain some things. I need to get some other things done first. Oh, I plan to get to join the church. But I got to get some up. For every potential disciple who is trying to finish their own plans first, let me give you a word of warning. You will run out of days before you run out of intentions. Jesus said, follow me. Every time Jesus made that call, it was expected for them to do it now, right now, do it now. Not wait after 12 verses of the invitation hymn, oh come, oh come. Jesus looked at him and said, follow me. And you had to make a decision because he was turning and walking away. There's a third potential disciple here. Following Jesus must have priority over your past. Verse 61, and another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand on the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Again, seems reasonable. He wanted to go back and tell everybody goodbye, his family and his friends. Again, Jesus sees beyond words, and he knows what this guy is seeking his family's approval. (laughs) I want to go back and make sure it's okay with mom. I guarantee you when he goes back home, everybody in the house is not going to say, oh, that's great, that's wonderful. Some of you, when you got saved, some of you to this day, because you're at church today, because you follow the Lord, some of your family thinks you're a little nuts. Some of your family give you a hard time. You think, they think you're a little too zealous about all that. Jesus says to follow him, we must be willing to cut relationships old friends and old family who think you're crazy. You've gone off in some religious frenzy here. This potential disciple used the most dangerous word in all of the Bible when it comes to dealing with God. Did you catch it? You should never use it in his presence. It is an abomination to him. It is an insult to him. It's the word but. But. I preached a sermon one time. I need to re-preach it sometime. Uh, The title of it was, You Sure Do Have a Big Butt. Okay? You sure do have a big butt. This man said, I will follow you, but. God, I will follow you, but. That's the heaviest but you will ever see. Because it does not matter what is said after that, because that word but cancels it all out. You've been handing Jesus some excuses, Okay? I love David Ring. You ever seen him as the guy with cerebral palsy, his evangelist with cerebral palsy? He says, I've got cerebral palsy. What's your excuse? You can always find an excuse. You can always find one. You can always. Jesus says, do not look back or you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. We used to plant a big garden at our house. We weren't farmers. We didn't have a farm. But my grandfather planted about, I don't know, 10 acres. It was way too much to us. And anyway, I remember being on that planter, and if you sat on that planter, look back over your shoulder, watching it drop seeds, you're going to plow a crooked row. And crooked rows did not set well with Casey Jones, okay? That's my grandfather. You have to keep your eyes on where you're going. As we move through this life, becoming closer and closer, conformed to the image of Christ, he says, don't look back, look ahead. Keep focused on what is going. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Become like him. Are you doing that? Our church does not need more members. We need more disciples and disciple makers. Our church does not need more believers. We need more disciples and disciple makers. Jesus is screaming to you today, follow me. What's your excuse? What's your excuse? 
when the Spanish explorer Cortez landed at Veracruz in 1519, he had 700 men with him, only 700. That was a small number for what he wanted to do. And as they stood on the shores deciding what they were going to do, he set fire to the fleet of 11 ships they'd come over. As those men stood there watching those ships burn, they knew there was only one way to go. There was no return. There was no looking back. It was only forward. Some of you need to burn some ships. You spend way too much time worried about other things other than what God's called you to be. And it frustrates the fire out of Jesus. Are you frustrating him? Do you always talk about how wonderful you are to him and you feel like you got a monopoly on God and you got it just figured out and everybody else is kind of crazy? Do you feel like you, you, you're, you're, you, you know everybody needs to listen to you? Are you insensitive, got a mean spirit? Are you making excuses? You say, well, what's the big deal? He knows that I'm, I'm imperfect. The big deal is, is that God requires, God demands, God expects, God wants, God loves our obedience. But it hurts me personally, too, because I know I'm not right before God. And if you're here today and you're not saved, these type things, this spirit can lock you out of heaven. It can lock you into hell. In 18, 1982, the ABC Evening News did a special about this, this thing. I, I forgot what they called it. I don't even know what, it doesn't even have a name. Anyway, they had set up a shotgun right in front of a chair. And you could come and sit in that chair and look down the barrel of that shotgun. They had set up a special timer on that trigger that sometime in the next 100 years, that gun would go off. Nobody knew when, nobody knew. And people would actually come and sit in that chair and look down the barrel of that gun. That's crazy, isn't it? Guess what? Every single day, people stare down the barrel of what their sin has done to them, knowing that Jesus can forgive that. All they got to do is get out of that stupid chair, and they stare down the barrel not knowing when it's going to go off. Hmm. How foolhardy are you today? Come on. Quit frustrating Jesus. Give him your heart. Give him your obedience. We, there's none of us can score 100 on this, okay, including your pastor. I frustrate him sometimes. Let's get this right, okay? I want you to bow your head, okay? Father, Lord, we know that there are folks that just spend a lifetime gambling <laughs> their life away like those that sit in front of that gun. And Father, there's some of us here today, and we are so full of excuses, and we're so, we think that God just is blessed to have us, and we treat other people poorly. God, all of these things are frustrating to our Lord because he was none of these things. So, Father, there's a man or a woman here today that needs to be saved, a boy or a girl. Need to give their life to you. And I pray for their courage to, to do that, to make that move today. And Lord, there are other people here who need to join the church and get more involved. They just need to get in this office and just dedicate themselves to you. So, God, I pray for your spirit to move. Speak to them. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand up, guys. We're going to sing.